All right, well, thank you, Henry, for the, the lovely introduction, as always. And thank you again to Fela um, for a wonderful first half of the presentation. I hope I can live up to that high standards. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be doing the second half of the talk and the second half of Neutron Delivery and focusing on two separate things, rainbow drives, rainbows and Doppler drives. So I'm going to be splitting it into two sections. The first half is going to be on prisms. Um, and then the second half, yeah, will be on Doppler drives. So I firstly wanted to kind of recap a couple of things based on the first talk that we had. Uh, we all know what a neutron is. It's a subatomic particle. It has an up quark, two down quarks. Um, and I think it was in 1924 that it was de Broglie who hypothesized that it could also be treated as a wave. Um, and he did this by the equation on the center of the screen there. And he related the wavelength to the Planck's constant and the momentum, the mass times the velocity of the particle. Um, and as Henry rightly commented in the previous talk, that can be kind of quantum mechanically represented as a wave packet. Um, and basically the, the packet length is on the order of microns and this is the coherent length of the neutron. And that's different depending on the different directions of the beam. So. Um, the wave packet along the beam is to do with the wavelength spread and then per perpendicularly to the beam is to do with the lambda and col collimation of the radiation. And the wavelength itself, the neutrons is of the order of angstroms. Um, and as Fella mentioned earlier, the cold neutrons energy is around 0.1 to 100 milli, milli electron volts. And that gives you, you know, an approximate wavelength of three to 30 angstroms. Um, and again, this, you can very much think of this half of the talk as an extension of Feller's previous work. So there are kind of three ways to uh, measure the neutron wavelength. And the first is like time of flight, then you've got your monochromator, your multilayer crystal sources, and then you've got your selectors. Now the rainbows method is using a time of flight. And then in the second half with the Doppler drives, that's gonna be using a monochromator. Um, this talk doesn't really focus on selectors, but I, given the bird analogy, I, I don't think I could improve on what you already know. Um, so just kind of to talk about the time of flight stuff, um, basically you have the, the chopper, which rotates, and basically that starts a timer of when the neutrons leave the chopper and then it travels a fixed distance of L, your flight distance, and then it hits um, your sample, and then that's your time. And basically how you can relate the wavelength to that is you take de Broglie's relation of H over MV and then you substitute in for the velocity, which is of course distance divided by time. And as the expression shows in the bottom, you can see that lambda is proportional to the time taken. Um, yes, and basically the, the multi-layer crystal sources can be seen as the Bragg refraction um, in Feller's work again, I don't really need to explain it twice, um, but the main relationship to the wavelength is 2D sine theta. Yeah. Okay, so we've heard a lot about choppers. I'm basically gonna explain why they're bad. So you have a, a neutron source and then the neutrons travel through, you know, your collimation, your beam slits, everything. And then eventually you get your, to your monochromator, your chopper. Um, the picture at the top has three slits and that's actually made of carbon fiber, but for the purposes of this, just think of the one in the center with the single slit. Um, and then as previously explained, the, the neutrons pass through the slit and then they reach the sample. Um, and this is reliant on kind of two things. This is reliant on the resolution and it's reliant on the transmission. Um, and importantly, the transmission is basically psi, which is the, the angle of the slit in the chopper and that is a fraction of the total 360 degrees. So you can kind of think of it as um, how many, your, the amount of neutrons that are getting through the chopper is proportional to the, the amount of empty space in the chopper. Um, and then to kind of make a comparison between choppers or monochromators or selectors, you kind of, you need a ratio. You need to find out the transmission per resolution of that particular device. And the expression in the bottom right does exactly that and it tells you um, that your relationship is lambda over the maximum lambda. Um, and to kind of put this into context, you've got to imagine a scenario. Imagine you're on Figaro and your maximum wavelength is 25 angstroms. Um, and then at that wavelength of 
25 angstroms, your transmission is directly equivalent to your, your resolution. But at a, at a wavelength of 2.5 angstroms, the transmission is actually 10 times less than the resolution because you've got 2.5 divided by 25, and that's a factor of 10. Um, and basically, in the scenario I've picked on this, on this paper is that 99% of the neutron top blocks, um, choppers are incredibly inefficient at getting things through that hole. Um, and ideally what we want is a detector that measures the position and the wavelength. Um, because that means we don't have any problems with transmissions and it's all directly related to the amount of absorption that the sample can have. Um, and just to kind of emphasize this problem, the wavelength of range we want to measure is dependent on the period of the chopper and we can't spin the chopper faster than the slowest time of flight, i.e. the one that the longest wavelength um, neutron takes. And this is known as the, the frame overlap problem. Um, and basically, if you send a pulse before the first pulse gets to the detector, you, you get a mixture of short and long wavelengths arriving at different times. And this is the major um, constraint on, on choppers. And the idea is to use a prism to kind of break this constraint because the, for a prism, the longest wavelength is essentially unlimited um, and your transmission and your resolution is completely separate. Like your transmission is simply your absorption. Um, and then the resolution itself is just about the dispersion power. Um, you don't get that with a chopper, it's completely fixed. Uh, yeah. So I kind of also wanted to just comment on the refraction of the prism because I know that this actually came up as a question in the last talk. Um, we're all very familiar with Snell's law in relation to light. Um, it's n1 sine theta one equals n2 sine theta two um, and where theta one and theta two are to the normal. In this example, I've made it so that it's um, respect to the surface because that's really what we care about. Um, and importantly, this applies to neutrons as well. And what, what we really wanna know is the total deflected angle. And that's what phi is. Um, and basically this can pick up the energy of the neutron without throwing any of the neutrons away. Um, and the transmission doesn't have to be some fraction of the resolution. Um, and we're not interested in theta two at all, the refraction angle. We're only interested in the total deflection um, and for context, I, I think approximately it's one degree for 10 angstroms neutrons if the material is magnesium fluoride. Um, and on the right hand side, essentially what you've got is you've got some light coming into a mirror and then reflecting off the mirror and in, into a prism. And then the prism causes the dispersion of the wavelengths. Um, so what you have is a white beam undergoing refraction into the different components. And that's essentially the, the crux of, the, of the, the technique of rainbows. And rainbows very uh, nicely stands for refractive analysis of the incoming neutron beam over the white spectrum. Um, and on the right hand side, you can see a, a very nice figure where you can see uh, a massive neutron beam going into your collimation slits, S1 and S2. Um, and then that then hits the prism um, at an angle alpha um, to the, the angle to the surface. And then the prism spreads it out and then that hits the de detector and that's what gives you the, the curve that you see. Um, importantly, the, the top panel is the, is the direct beam, there's no sample in it. And in the bottom one, there is the sample at an angle theta. And how you get the reflectivity is that the ratio of the two intensities as a function of the wavelength allows the re reflectivity. Basically you divide um, this bottom um, intensity by the top one and that's how you find out. And this is actually implemented in the ILO D50 um, with a couple of parameters. You know, D1 is five meters and D2 2.9 meters and that kind of gives you, gives you an idea about the, the scale of this. Um, yeah, so the kind of thing that we want is to get Q. And that's relying on wavelength and theta. And what we want is the reflectivity of Q as normal, as you probably know. Theta is obvious from the detector, the way that it lands, but, and the wavelength typically is time of flight. But in this case, we get it from the deflection um, with respect to the undeflected. So this is the deflection with respect to the undeflected. Um, so interestingly, we've got, I'm gonna show some results. Um, Panels A and B are very, very similar. 
And that's because the two figures are for the two separate Q ranges. So low theta on the left of one degree, and then um, that gives the low Q range, and then high theta on the right-hand side gives you the high Q range. Um, and basically, if you merge them together, this gives the full two to three orders of magnitude to cover everything. Um, now in panel A on the left, what you have is the full spectrum measured in deflection angle. And this uh, gets the wavelength via Snell's law, as I previously demonstrated. Um, and as you can see, this, this curve here is almost, almost linear. There's zero deflection and there's um, a sharp rise here at around three angstroms. And then just to preempt any questions, this dip dip here is down to um, a couple of upstream instruments, a couple of um, very monochromators that stole a couple of neutrons. That's why you see a little dip there. Um, and then the green one is the beam that actually went through the reflection. Uh, it's the one that went through the sample. And the reason that these kind, they, they merge at this point is total reflection. So this is where the total number of neutrons that went in also came back out. Um, yeah, and to get the reflectivity, basically you divide the green line by the red one. Um, yeah, so, and then to go on kind of panel B is just the, the, the prism and detector setup just rotated a little bit more. Um, and what, what you can see is basically the reflectivity is just much, much lower. Um, you still see the oscillations, this black curve here, um, but it's much, much closer to the, the background. Um, so you have to be careful when you're, you're actually mathematically subtracting the background from the actual sample. Um, the panel B doesn't have the, the tall red curve just simply because it's exactly the same and it's you know several orders of magnitude bigger. So you'd actually, you wouldn't see any of this. This would just be, this would be noise if you included it. Um, this, this peak here is quite interesting. Basically, it's in, you'll notice it's in the negative deflection and that's because this is actually the, the beam coming into the, the prism and being reflected back directly. It's not going through the sample at all. Um, and basically this kind of, this kind of highlights the fact that there are intrinsic losses to the prism, um, but kind of panel C shows that actually not much is lost. Like you cannot really distinguish between the two. So to elaborate on the figure a bit more, all you have in blue is the, is the prism measurement. And then in red, you have the a comparison with the time of flight um, measurement made on uh, D17. And then you also have the fit in black. And what it, what it shows you is that actually, you know, these results are meaningful and this technique is meaningful. Um, and yeah, I've put a couple of points here. You've got good resolution, low background and a 19 times gain over the normal time of flight. Um, and really, really to kind of emphasize this point is this figure, which I really like. Um, so if you just take a, a normal nickel sample you know, these experiments haven't really changed in about 25 years. So take a nickel sample in 1995, these measurements would have taken eight hours. And then in 2010, they go down to one second, 2015, 0.36 seconds, 2018, same time, but a gain of three. But now using a prism, you have a gain of like 19 times of the 2018 results. Um, and I, I just think that's very, very impressive as a, as a technique, as an improvement. Um, yeah, so just to kind of summarize a few things at this point. Um, one thing to note is that this technique requires really good collimation. So with reflectometry, that doesn't, that doesn't really matter because you already, that's already very, very important to, sw to, to swap to a prism setup. You know, it's not that outrageous. Um, but you also need a detector with like really, really high resolution. So, a lot of the instruments that I allow use helium-3 detectors, I believe, and that simply they're just not good enough. Um, you need a scintillator or something, you need something 10 times better with you know, area tracking and things. Um, another point is if the sample was bent, um, this could cause like beam dispersion. Um, although if the mirror was bent, that would cause beam dispersion. So when you actually get to the prism, then the beam is hitting the prism at different points and then you're gonna get very, a very confused beam. Um, so that doesn't really make sense. 
Um, but overall, this kind of outlines the feasibility of a new high, tran high transmission method of measuring neutron wavelengths without choppers. Um, and another advantage is that a prism operates continuously um, with transmissions, you know, orders of magnitude higher than choppers. Um, and you can capture a wide range of wavelengths simultaneously, which is great for kinetic studies. Um, and again, you know, great resolution, great count rates, um, low gamma sensitivity and low intrinsic noise. Um, I think we'll mark this to be a pretty good technique. Um, so this kind of takes me to the, the second half of the talk, which is <laughs> quite a bit different from the first half. So if you've fallen asleep, try again. Um, I'm gonna firstly go through like what a Doppler drive actually is, um, where it's used and how it works, and then summarize everything. So I've got this very, very dated video. I don't know when it's from, but I, I really like it. Um, hopefully you can see it moving. I don't think you can actually, I don't know. We can see the video, but it's not moving yet. Yeah, my, my curse is showing it. Showing it's very confused. OK, you don't really need. You, you have the cap uh, capacity and principle to put a pointer on the screen, which you might find useful to show what you're talking about, or else just use your cursor, I guess. Yeah, I think, basically, I think the video is just not going to stream very well. It works quite well offline. But can you can you see my cursor or do I need a pointer? I can see the cursor, no problem. Okay, that 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 would be sufficient. Basically, the monochromator is this this uh, silver part here, and what it does is it pushes it backwards and forwards. Um, this is a very old and outdated model, um, as you can probably guess by you know the amount of wiring and. Um, there are a lot of wheels that actually turn. There are genuinely wheels in this thing. Um, and this has recently been updated to like a linear motor, a linear Doppler motor. And it's much, much smaller in size. And uh, it's about 50 by 25 centimeters. And it does essentially the same, essentially the same thing. Um, so this is, this is actually used in the IN16B. And this in down here. Um, and just go through what that actually is, is that you have your neutron beam going through a guide and then a velocity selector um, and passing all the way through a background chopper and then a phase uh, transformer chopper. And basically that means, so when you first hit it, it deflects and then it hits your monochromosome, which is this, and then it uses um, Bragg reflection, 90 degrees um, backscattering Bragg reflection, and then it fires it back and then it hits, it passes through this chopper, then it hits the sample, gets spread out, hits all of these other monochromators, which are of the same type as the one over here. Um, and, and then these also use backscattering to go back through the sample and then hit the, the detector here. Uh, yes. So the, impo the important part of this is that it moves back and forth. And if you're moving something back and forth, and it's a wave, you're going to get the Doppler effect, essentially. And we all, we all know what the Doppler effect is. I think if a, an ambulance drives past with its sirens on, you know, the wave is going to be compressed if it's moving towards you, and then it's a higher pitch. Um, and then if it's moving away from you, the waves or phonons elongate, and then they get a, a lower frequency. Um, and that can, that can be broadly related to the, to the equation on the right, where C is the propagation speed. And, the waves in the medium and then VR and VS are, you know, the source and receiver velocities. Um, so neutron backscattering spectroscopy is a particularly good technique. So as Fella said, you can basically, in monochromators, you can select which um, energies, velocities you want the neutrons and waves to have by based on the Bragg angle. Um, but the point Backscattering is that at low at low Bragg angles, for a, let's say a bandwidth of theta of ten, um, you actually have a very quite high um, dispersion in your wavelength as well, about one on this axis. Um, but as you increase in the Bragg angle, you actually get this um, as a much much smaller 
um, variation in your wavelength. And that basically means you know what you're getting out if you're putting it in. And that makes sense because you're not actually passing through the material, really. You're just bouncing in and then bouncing straight back off. Um, so to kind of visualize that, on the left, you have um, Bragg's law in a static reference frame where the monochromator in question is just a, a silicon 111 um, sample, crystal, crystal lattice. And then you've got your instant energy of 2080 microelectron volts, which is a very standard amount for this kind of thing. Um, and then you just get that reflected back off and the arrows are the same length, the, the energy is exactly the same. This is an elastic interaction. Um, but on the right hand side, what I've added in is the linear Doppler motor itself. And this can move backwards and forwards at 4.5 meters per second. So this is kind of as fast as it will go. I think maybe you could get it to 4.7 if you, if you really try, um, but then, then you're pushing it. So for the same amount of energy going in, based on the position of the Doppler motor, you're gonna get different energies out. And the best way to think about this, I think, is that imagine you're playing tennis if a ball comes towards you, you and you, you move your racket towards the ball, you're going to give the ball more, more energy, right? And that ball is going to go back the other way. Um, but if, you, if the ball is coming towards you and you move the Doppler motor with the ball, and then, and then you hit it, 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 the wavelength is going to be longer, the, the energy is going to be lower. Um, so ba basically, this can be summarized on the next slide where you have an energy difference. You might have an instant energy of 2080 and then a final energy of 2110. And then this gives you an energy difference of about 30 microelectron volts. And this is, this is the standard calculation for say silicon 111. And notably it's, it's plus or minus 30 um, based on whether the Doppler thing is going forwards or backwards. Um, I'm gonna try this video, but I don't really think it's gonna work. Oh well, no, I won't play the video. I'm just gonna take three frames of it. Um, so basically this is, at this point you have a green beam just going through. Um, it passes through the deflector chopper and then sends it to here. And then you have it basically moving back and backwards and forwards um, like that. Then it hits the sample and then it hits your, your analyzer arcs and then it goes back to the detector. So now these green uh, circles represent, represent the neutrons of a certain energy. We'll call it a green energy. Um, and then they elastically uh, hit this. Note that in this case, the Doppler motor didn't move. This is just as an example. Um, and then they're scattered by sample here and they have all of these different colors different energies and then these are all going to be reflected by by the monochromatists they were absorbed um now importantly well to clarify these monochromatists are of course selecting certain energies certain wavelengths and so what you can see is that they're selecting for the green one right because the greens have made it through here this is the what you've prepared um and they hit the sample of this one by chance is also green. It will be the one that gets reflected and then absorbed in the detectors. Yeah. Um, one, of, one of the key points of the linear Doppler motor over the predecessor is the velocity profiles. So what this basically allows you to do is you can define whatever profile you want to put through. Um, and so let's say you wanted a displacement profile of a sine wave. Um, how that would actually come about in the Doppler motor is um, a cosine wave because you're, you're differentiating um, to get from one to the other. And so if you wanted a rectangular wave, you put in a triangular wave in them. I get that. And What's interesting is that you can you can do this almost immediately, just in a matter of seconds. You can swap profiles, whereas with the older steam engine based one, you know that would, you just couldn't do that. You just didn't have that flexibility. Um, so we're going to go through some little results. Um, so the elastic, the EFWS is the elastic fixed window scan. 
And the, the, the key word there is elastic. Um, that's when the monochromator is resting. And all events must have therefore been scattered elastically on sample. Uh, and basically, the elastically scattered intensity uh, equals zero can be recorded as a function of you know, temperature, which is the, as you can see down here. Um, and a bit, the importance of this is that you can get a quick overview of the dynamics of the sample based on temperature um, at a given you know, elastic energy. Um, when the dynamical processes kind of accelerate with increasing temperature, um, and become faster than the, the, the time defined by the instrumental resolution, um, you actually you start to see a, a decrease in the intensity and that's, that's what that is. Um, now the IFWS is the inelastic fixed window scan. Um, and this is, in this particular example, this is where the monochromator is, is moved following a rectangular velocity profile. Um, and as you can see, the, the, the temperature profile follows a, a continually increasing kind of slope or ramp, whatever. And the different inelastic energy transfer windows can be repeatedly cycled in order to measure all of the blue lines at, at once. Um, and to kind of express that, if you take this point here at something above zero Kelvin or whatever it is, instead of moving first along the temperature axis, you can move along the energy axis. So you can take this point, this point, this point, this point, and you can do um, all of the energies for that given temperature, then you can move up to the next temperature. Um, and that basically speeds everything up by a lot, um, which I think I'm gonna come to in a couple of slides actually, or slides. Um, and when the dynamical, yeah, okay. I should explain that the sample in question is ferrocene. Um, and basically that undergoes a phase transition. So when the dynamical ring rotation process in ferrocene accelerates with increasing temperature, you actually see a peak as a function of temperature. Um, and this is the, the peak here between 120 and 160 Kelvin. Um, and then the sudden decrease at around 164, um, that's due to the phase transition of the ferrocene sample. Um, I think it's to the, the monoclinic crystal phase, but I'm, I'm not a chemist. Um, so again, it's just another way of, of quickly scanning all of the, the, the dynamics of the sample. Um, and basically, I think each point took around 30 seconds, whereas, bef and the whole, the whole thing took around five hours, which apparently, which is incredible, apparently. Normally it takes a lot, a lot longer. Um, so kind of just to summarize this, this part of it, you've got a new model of the lineage optimizer, um, which is smaller, faster, more flexible. Like it's got the, the different velocity profiles you can use. Um, and then you can measure multiple energy profiles at a given temperature. Um, the disadvantage is basically, especially with the older models, basically you have a really long warm up time. Um, it's slow, you've only got one velocity profile. And another disadvantage is that you're also limited to only uh, 30 micro electron volts um, as an energy transfer. And this is based on the, the Doppler drive itself can't move faster than 4.5 meters per second. It's, it's, a, it's a limitation on the actual apparatus. Um, but the, there are ways around this, but I think it was a bit beyond the scope of the talk. Um, yeah, so just to kind of cover what, or recap what we've covered, we've got two fundamental um, techniques that are kind of at the forefront of, you know, beam delivery. Um, and they've both got a lot of potential, I think, in the future. So I just, yeah, thank you for listening. Uh, special thanks to Marcus Appel and Bob Kubitz, because they, I couldn't have done this without them. They're both great people and really know the stuff. And yeah, I'll now take any questions that you might have.